Her Excellency Do Aung San Suu Kyi, State Councillor of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. Dear guests, His Excellency Mr. Cho Win, His Excellency Mr. King Mountain, His Excellency Mr. Turain Tanjin, Mr. Cho Zeya, Mr. Koko Nain, Mr. Win Cho Aung, Mr. Myo Tampe, Mr. Aung Kain Tun, His Excellency Mr. Tateshi Higuchi, His Excellency Mr. Yoichi Suzuki, Mr. Ichiro Maruyama, Mr. Tetsuji Miyamoto, Mr. Hiroshi Yoshimoto. We gather today to award Her Excellency Do Aung San Suu Kyi with the, the honorary degree of doctor for her contributions to the advancement of democracy in Myanmar and in the world as a whole. Do Aung San Suu Kyi in Kyoto, we highly value warm relations between people and so I hope you, you will not mind if we affectionately call you Suchi san Throughout her fight for democracy, Suchi san has endured many hardships. <coughs> she res resisted the military government in her country through non-violent means and led the National League for Democracy, even while under house arrest for over 15 years. Her efforts were certainly not in vain. During the elections in 2015, the National League for Democracy was supported by a great majority, and that support led to a peaceful transfer of power and a shift to a more civilian based political system. Today, in her role of state councillor, Su Chi San leads the construction of a more integrated society and the implementation of economic reforms for her country's rapid development. The gradual pacification of historic ethnic grievances and the lifting of 20 years long sanctions in October are very clear evidence of progress that is being made. Suji san inspires people all around the world who are engaged in the fight for democracy. Her efforts also deepen awareness among those who currently enjoy basic human rights, and she has demonstrated that such rights must be attained and maintained with determination, responsibility, and strength of mind. From a young age, she strove for the advancement of her country, and part of her career took place here at Kyoto University. From 1985 to 86, she was engaged in research at our Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Her research focused on her father, General Aung San, commitment to advancing freedom and unity in her then newly independent country. Since that time, Su Chi San has honored us with a previous visit in 2013, when she was awarded the title of Honorary Fellow of Kyoto University and we are delighted to welcome her here again today to receive her honorary doctorate. To date, Kyoto University has conferred 13 honorary doctoral degrees on outstanding scholars for their scientific contributions in various fields. This is the first time that the university has conferred such an honorary degree on an individual for their commitment to freedom, 
democracy and human rights. This honorary degree expresses the respect that Kyoto University holds for Suchi san's work and achievements which resonate with the university's guiding principles that encourage freedom of thought and the promotion of a harmonious global society. Suchi san, you are a tremendous inspiration, not only to our students, faculty and staff, but to people everywhere. In appreciation of your outstanding ac accomplishments, I am delighted to award you on behalf of Kyoto University with this honorary degree of doctor. Thank you very much. So we will now proceed with the awarding of the honorary doctorate. I'd like to invite Her Excellency Do Aung San Suu Kyi to the podium. Your Excellency, please. Kyoto University has conferred on Aung San Suu Kyi the honorary degree of doctor for her outstanding contribution to the advancement of science and culture. In testimony thereof, the undersigned has affixed it the seal of the university. Witness my hand this third day of November 2016. Juichi Yamagiwa, President, Kyoto University. Congratulations. Now, we'd like to present Her Excellency Do Aung San Suu Kyi with the honorary academic store. And now, I'd like to ask Her Excellency to say a few words. Thank you very much. I would like to say that it is indeed a great pleasure for me to be back here in the city of Kyoto and in this University of Kyoto. When I came to Japan for the first time 30 years ago, almost to the day, because I came in October 1985, my young son and I were welcomed by this city and by this university. It was wonderful how quickly we felt we were part of the life here. And it is amazing that even now, after 30 years, when I was in Tokyo, I found that I'd forgotten all my Japanese. But when I came to Kyoto, skoshi skoshi wakarimasu. There is a magic about this place. It is its beauty, its history, its culture, and with regard to the university, its academic excellence, and its international reputation. Its international reputation is based to a large extent on its capacity to engage with and to absorb the many scholars from all across the world who have visited this university. I know what a rare prize it is to be awarded an honorary doctorate from this university, especially since this is the first time somebody with no, no real achievements in science has been awarded such a degree. 
But of course, the science of politics, which is, which is really the science of people trying to live together in a civilized society, is fundamental for the promotion of other scholarly works. Without peace and without freedom, it will not be able, we will not be able to achieve academic excellence. We need peace, we need freedom. We also need the affluence that will enable us to do the kind of research that pushes the world forward and that will elevate the status of human society. When I was told that I was going to be awarded an honorary doctorate, I wondered whether it was going to be in law. But this is an unusual doctorate because it is for what I have done for the advancement of democracy in my own country and, as the chair, uh, President kindly said, in the world at large. Advancement is a correct word because we have not yet reached our goal. In a sense, with democracy, we can say that we will never reach our goal. Our goal has to be beyond reach because we have to keep working towards it. Once we stop working for democracy, democracy will fade away. It is like an unused muscle. We have to keep it exercised all the time. I keep reminding our people how important it is for us not just to claim our democratic privileges, but also to, to discharge our democratic duties that we may be able to make our society a vibrant one politically, socially, and culturally. Kyoto is a great center of culture. And before we came into this room, the chairman and I were discussing the importance of culture and cultural exchanges. Culture is something that we can keep alive only if people believe in it. You can't force people to preserve a culture. You can force them only externally. You can lay down rules and regulations. You can promulgate laws that force people to keep to a certain type of culture, but it will be just a dead visage. It will be not alive, it will be not real and genuine. So to keep culture really alive, we have to keep the human spirit alive, which is why I say that the science of politics is the most important science, the science of people living together in peace and in harmony that the human race might progress. It is not for me to lecture to academics because I'm not myself an academic. <laughs> and it is a very dangerous thing to try to do. So I'm simply putting to them my views on how we think that academia can cooperate and work together with not just with the students that come to the university, but with people in general, with different countries, with different systems, with different cultures, to make sure that our world is moving in the right direction. Well, the world is round, and because it is going round and round, we never really know where we are going sometimes. And this is a mystery and a challenge. We hope that we're going in the right direction. We can never be sure. Of course, I think that the positive aspects of human nature outweigh the negative. Because if this were not so, I think we'd still be running around in caves. I'm not sure, but I think so. And it is the opposite, uh, the positive aspects in our nature which have bring up, uh, brought us forward to this point where people from all over the world can meet together. I think predominantly in this room they are Japanese and people from Burma, but I believe that perhaps there are a few from other countries as well. And for people from different parts of the world to come together and to be able to communicate with one another, that in itself is a truly amazing achievement. When we think that just 100 years back, this would have been almost an impossibility for people of all ages, from different aspects of life, from different countries, to meet in one room and not think this extraordinary at all. And this is the achievement of our world. And democracy also is part of the achievement of the human race. The belief that people 
can gather together and come to a wise common decision. That is indeed an act of faith. And it is based on this faith that we have struggled for democracy in Burma and for peace because there can't be peace without democracy, and there can't be democracy without peace. We have just started out on the road to stabilizing our democratic roots and to achieving peace, which has long eluded us for our country. We hope that the time is not far when we can say, we have achieved peace for our country, and we have strengthened the democratic roots of our society. That, so that coming generations may be secure in the knowledge that their country will be shaped as they would wish it to be. And for this, we would like to thank our friends from all over the world who have helped us in various ways. And among those friends who have helped us is Kyoto University. When I came here in 1985, the movement for democracy had not yet started, but yet, Kyoto University was kind enough to welcome me and to treat me with no less consideration than I am treated today. In fact, I think I was treated more warmly and more as a human being 30 years ago than I am now as a representative of a government. I don't know why people want to be representatives of governments, because I think it's much better to be just yourself. I've always found that people are much warmer towards you, and the way in which the people of Kyoto took me to their hearts 30 years ago, that could not be bettered in any way. So I would like to conclude by saying thank you to the university, thank you to the people of Kyoto. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Mingalaba. Um, uh, President Juichi Yamagiwa, uh, Your Excellency Aung San Suu Kyi Sang, honored guests, and especially all of the students who have gathered here today from Kyoto University and from other places, we'd like to give you a very warm uh, thanks for having come here today. Uh, my name is uh, Mario Lopez. I'm an associate professor at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And uh, today I will be the MC uh, for the discussion between Kyoto University students and our honorable guest today, Aung San Suu Kyi San. Um, today we are honored to have you here and actually many students wanted to be present. Uh, however, this venue is, uh, has limited space so we could only uh, invite a fraction of the students who actually wanted to come. However, from all of the students who have come here today, uh, we have managed to uh, choose eight very bright young uh, students from Kyoto University to put forward some questions to you uh, and to know your opinions on these questions. So um, what I would like to do now is I would like to call up the eight students who are present here today who will be in discussion. So the eight students at the back, could I ask you to come forward to the podium, please? OK, so from now on, we will have questions uh, from students who have come here today. So without further ado, what I would like to do is first of all invite Kazuma Komatsubara to ask his question. Mingaraba, my name is Kazuma Komatsubara. I major in economics in Kyoto University, and I also belong to the American Football Club. <laughs> it is a great honor to be here today and meet you. Uh, today, I want to ask you about motivation. The American Football Club uh, is aiming to win the national championship, but many people, even the students of Kyoto University, uh, believe that it is not possible. In the same way, I think the world thought that it was very difficult for you to fight for democracy when you were placed under house arrest for a total of 15 years. Uh, during those years, what kept you going and what motivated you when you were trying to accomplish something that many other people believed it was difficult to do? Thank you.
Well, you use the word impossible. People say that it would be impossible for you to win the war, the, the championship. I, that reminds me of a motto that was on the wall, I believe, of an RAF station during the Second World War, where they said that we do the impossible every day, but miracles take a little longer. So you have to keep that in mind. The impossible is something that you should be able to achieve every day. Every day you should be able to achieve something different, something new, something that you have not achieved before. When we were str struggling for democracy, there were times when it was very difficult. Uh, our whole party was reduced to no more than a very small room in Rangoon, which passed as a headquarters. But we never thought that we would fail because we believed in what we were doing. And I think this is the greatest motivation. You have to believe in what you are doing and you have to have the faith to keep going. It's not enough hoping. I always say that it's, it's, uh, hope is no use without endeavor. If you want something, you've got to work for it. But you've got to believe in it. If you don't believe in it, you won't really work hard for it. If the members of the team don't believe that they will ever won win the championship, you will not win it because they won't work hard enough to win it. They won't have the faith that will motivate them. They won't have this intrinsic belief that they are capable of doing it. We always believed that we would win through because we believed that our cause was just. I won't use the word right, because right can be interpreted in many ways. But, I, but uh, we believed that it was just because what we were trying to achieve was for our whole society, for our whole country, not for our party. So because of our faith in what we were doing, we were able to win through. The mind you, we're not at the end of the road yet. And that takes a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, to make a, a remark. You said it was a dialogue, but why is it that I'm going to be asked all the questions? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not a dialogue. That's a question and answer session. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we would now like to uh, turn to our second student here. Um, this will be uh, Soyako Harima. Thank you. Uh, hello, Suji san. Uh, my name is Soyako Harima, a fourth year student in the faculty of law. Uh, I really enjoyed the past four years as a Kyoto University student. Uh, including uh, studying abroad program in Uppsala University in Sweden and Oxford University. And, and uh, I'm going to graduate the Kyoto University very soon and I have to uh, think about my future, my very first career. And so recently, um, I'm always asking myself questions about my life uh, what do I want to achieve in my life, or what kind of person do I want to be? Uh, meanwhile, uh, you have dedicated yourself into uh, achieving democracy and peace in your country. And now people uh, respect you as a role model. And so uh, here I would like to ask these questions. Uh, who do you respect as your role model? And what kind of philosophy or idea uh, have you kept in your mind during your whole life? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've always found the expression role model rather difficult to cope with. I'm not exactly sure what it means. Does it mean that somebody uh, whom you wish to emulate? Because I don't think there's any one particular person that I wish to emulate, if that is what it means role model means. I have great admiration and respect for my father, not just as my father, but as a leader of our country. But there are other people whom I respect as well. And we were talking about science earlier. For example, I have a great respect for Marie Curie. And I often think that if I'd re read her biography early in life, I might well have gone in for science. But I read it too late to be able to change my, my subject. But uh, I don't think you should look to one particular person as a role model because nobody is perfect. We all have our weaknesses and our strengths. So what you have to do is to decide for yourself how best you can contribute to the well-being of the society in which you live. That doesn't have to be in a large way. I often think that people who discharge their duties and their responsibilities fully, whatever these may be, are far more effective than those who may be in very important positions, but who abuse their power 
and their and their influence uh, in a way that is negative for society as a whole. When I was trying to make our people understand what democracy was all about, because we lost democracy back in 1962. That's more than 50 years ago when you were not even thought of. That's a long time ago. And uh, many of our people had no understanding what democracy was. And when my, we tried to make them understand and to become part of the movement, they would uh, ask questions as uh, like, but I'm nothing. I'm not educated. I'm just a street hawker. How can I help? Then I would say, if you are a street hawker and your work is simply to sell whatever it is you are, you are able to hawk around from one place to another, and if you, if you do it honestly, if you do it honestly in the, in the sense that you ask for the right price and whatever you are selling is what it's, it is, uh, what you say it is, then you are discharging your responsibilities. And you can also be pleasant about it. You can, you can try to make your surroundings a little better because of you. And I think this is how you have to look at it. You can't, everybody can't be, um, I, I have to word, use this word because this is, this is something that worries me. Everybody cannot be a celebrity. I think this is the age of celebrities. And people think that you have to be an, a celebrity in order to be someone. I don't think this is the case. I've always said that the most effective people in our movement were our unknown soldiers, those who worked for the movement without ever being recognized in any way. And they were happy to do that. So I think it's what you can contribute, what you, what you think you can contribute, not what you think you can get back. That will give you the greatest satisfaction. So just find that out for yourself and don't look for role models. They get you very confused. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we would now like to, to turn to our next student, uh, Yuki Masuo. Hello, my name is Yuki Masuo. I'm thrilled and honored to be here today to have the privilege to ask you a question. I am a, a fifth year student at the Faculty of Medicine, Kyoto University. I am currently receiving training at hospital every day. During bedside training, I experienced various circumstances whereby the immediate action of doctors was needed. You are now the political leader of the state of Myanmar. I believe you continuously face many situations whereby you have to make difficult and important decisions, ones which greatly influence citizens in your country. Generally speaking, make a decision, you have to let go of all the other possibilities. In order to make the right decision, you need to consider pros and cons carefully. So I have two questions for you today. The first question is, how do you make decisions as a state leader? The second question is, what was the most difficult decision you have made in your entire life? <laughs> well. Uh, you, you talk about making the right decision. Now, <laughs> not just making decisions, but making the right decision. Uh, I've often said that in politics, there isn't just one right answer. There are several answers that may well be right, but you have to choose one. And I think it's the same with you when you're making a difficult decision. It means that you're not quite sure which is the right one. If you're perfectly sure, then it would be no problem. If it was a, a very clear case of either this or that, then that's no problem. You choose whatever is right. But sometimes there are several alternatives. And then I think the problem starts. You begin to wonder which one to choose. But the point is that you have to make a choice. You have to bear the responsibility for your choice. That is the first thing you have to recognize. Whatever decision you make, you must bear the responsibility. But once you've chosen it and you are I think envisaging a situation where it isn't the, the, the right decision is not obvious, then once you've chosen one decision which you hope is right, then you've got to make it the right one. You've got to try your best to make it work. And that's how it is with politics. We've had to make difficult decisions. Uh, let, let me give you a couple of very uh, concrete examples. In 2010, the first uh, uh, general elections in so many years 
in more than 26, in more, well, in 26 years, I think, were held in 2010. And we had to make a decision as to whether or not we were going to contest the elections. And in order to contest the elections under the new constitution, we had to re-register our party. And in order to re-register our party, we would be obliged to expel all our members who were either in prison or who had been tried. Now, I was included among those. So we had to make this very, very, very important decision. Do we contest the elections and expel all our most dedicated and committed members, because these were the ones who were in jail, or do we stay out of the elections and risk uh, risk becoming an, a, a, an illegal organization. We decided that we would not contest the elections. Now that was a difficult decision because it could have destroyed our party. But we decided that if we were to expel our most committed members, if we were to turn our backs on them for the sake of our own safety as a party, our party would not be in a position to work for the people in the long run. But of course we would have lost credibility. But of course, it was a dangerous decision as well. We contested uh, the, the law that required us to re-register in court, saying that when we previously registered as a political party, this was not part of the rules. So that, that was one of the decisions we took. And uh, we lived with it for two years. Then we were given an opportunity to take part in the by-elections. And again, the, the then government invited us uh, to re-register as a party and take part in the by-elections. And we thought about this and we said, if that regulation about expelling our uh, members were changed, then we would, we would re-register. And they did change it. So we decided to re-register. Then we were criticized by people who said, why were we going in? for the elections this time. Why had we decided by, to re-register? But again, we decided that since this is the path we've chosen, we would make it work. And we made it work by winning the by-elections, by working hard to win the by-elections. So you can't always be sure that you're making the right decision. But once you've made the decision, just do everything possible to make it the right one. And as to which was the most difficult decision I've taken in my life, I can't say there's one particular one, but the, the ones I've mentioned have been difficult. The one uh, uh, I took in 2010 and then again in 2012. I'm sure there will be many more difficult ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite Ao Seo to put forward a question. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm so glad to see you today. Uh, my name is Ao Iseo. I'm, uh, I'm a student of Kyoto University uh, Graduate School of Environmental Studies. Uh, my major is civil engineering, especially I research about geotechnology. However, I would not like to ask you about soil or clay. Uh, I'm <laughs> Uh, I'm interested in what Myanmar will become and uh, how Myanmar will change. Uh, when I was told that I, I would be able to see you today and ask you a question, I researched about you online and uh, I got to know that you have lived in uh, India, Britain, America and also visited so many countries up to now. So I have a question about that. Among these countries, are there any countries that can be a model of the future of Myanmar about uh, democracy, uh, economy, or environmental policy? Anything is okay. Could you please teach me your vision of the uh, future of the Myanmar? Thank you. Well, my vision of the future of my country is an amalgam of, of all that is best in the, country, the countries you've mentioned. No country has everything that is best in the world. Some aspects of its society, some aspects of its government, some aspects of its economy are among the best, but not all. So you have to choose. Uh, I've found that wherever I've lived, once I get to know the place and the people, I start getting very fond of them because I begin to understand them. So in the end, what you need to do is to understand 
the situation of your own country if you want the best possible for it. Our, our people are quite different from the Japanese. I keep telling them that, the, I keep telling my people, you're not as disciplined as the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to learn. You've got to be. Uh, you've got to work harder, because we have been fortunate to live in a country where life was very easy for many, many decades. But it is not so now. And now that life is getting more difficult, our people are learning to work harder, which is a good thing. So. Uh, we want to learn from different countries, and we want to take the best from different countries. But one thing I do want to say is that we want to preserve the environmental beauty of our country. Because it will be very difficult to reverse the situation once it has been ruined. And as an environmentalist, I'm sure you understand this. And I would like you to invite you to come to Burma and look at it and see what can be done to make sure that we conserve its uh, beauty in the best way possible while making, it po uh, while making sure that our people are able to advance economically. Because let's not be romantic. Starving people cannot feed on beauty. They have to be able to have the necessary material ingredients that will make life uh, comfortable and happy, as well as the aesthetic pleasure of their surroundings. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your question. Next, we will have a question from Ayaka Nomura. Uh, Mingalava. Um, and I, I'm very honored to be here and to see you, Suji san My name is Ayaka Nomura. I'm a graduate student at the Graduate School of Advanced Integrated Studies in Human Survivability, called GSIS. Human? Human Survivability. <laughs> I know it's long, sorry about that. Okay. Um, actually, through our uh, school program, I stayed in Myanmar in this last August. So I visited your country's village, and they they welcomed us very warmly, and they loved they especially loved to feed us a lot. So we enjoyed it. Um, during our stay, I we have taken a lecture on the Myanmar's education system and its challenges. Um, educational disparity between cities and villages is one of the serious problems in Myanmar, I reckon. So could you please uh, share your thoughts on this, uh, on this topic? And also, what Japan, especially as Kyoto University, can support Myanmar in this regard? Thank you very much. Well, education is a big issue in my country because progress is based on a good education system. And once upon a time, that is to say, going back to the years when we first became an independent nation, our country was considered to have the best education system in the East. But of course, those days are long past and we cannot sit on, on our laurels. We have to rebuild our education system to make us fit to face the world in which we live. Now, you talked about the difference between the cities and the villages. That is very true, of course. And um, traditionally, there was very little difference between cities and villages. We, even now, in my country, you will not be able to tell from the way people speak what strata of society they come from. That is uh, the intrinsic uh, equality that has existed between our peoples since historic times. But now it's beginning to change. The privileged go to better schools. That is, is particularly within the last decade or so when private schools were once again allowed in our country. And then the gap between the, the well-educated elite, which is very, very small, and our people in the villages is getting broader and broader. I do not think that the standard of education between towns and villages on the whole is that far apart. But some parts of the country, particularly in the border areas, there the education system has to struggle, particularly in our ethnic areas where their mother tongue is not Burmese. And our education system is con uh, conducted in Burmese, which is the official language of our country. We've had to struggle with this because there were those who said that they should be allowed 
to teach in their mother tongue. But that brings many difficulties because we have officially 135 different ethnic groups. And it would be very difficult for us to conduct an education system where uh, different pockets of peoples were allowed to teach in different languages. And in any case, uh, some of those languages are, cannot be written down. Then there is no written language in some, in some ethnic groups, They're just a spoken language. So we couldn't possibly use it for education. So this uh, difference, uh, this uh, difference in language uh, makes, makes for, for a big gap in the achievement of the children in different areas. And we'll have to try to remedy it in various ways. First of all, we are now making it part of our law that the mother tongue can be used as a classroom language so that we can have assistant teachers translating into the mother tongue. But the teaching will have to be done in the main language, which is Myanmar or Burmese, because otherwise we will not be able to have an integrated education system. What our ethnic peoples want is a genuine federal system. And to achieve such a system, we have to make sure that there's a right balance between integration and between diversity. We have to be integrated as a nation, but we have to have diversity as different ethnic groups in order to keep the spirit of federalism alive. So this is a challenge that seeps into our education system. In which village were you staying? Was it in the mostly Myanmar part, or was it in one of the ethnic? Uh, we uh, stayed in Yangon and also Nepito. The village is, is the nearest to the uh, Nepito. Ah, well. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure that is the sort of village I had in mind. Um, and Neputo, by the way, is not typical of, of our country, as I'm sure you noticed. It's not the kind, you, you, you can find only one Neputo in Burma. Uh, but the villages where you were, yes, they would be different from the cities, but I don't think the gap between the villages in Neputo and some of the, some of the schools, I don't say all, in Yangon, for example, would be that large. No. Okay, Jesu Timbale. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we will now turn over to uh, Bo Sang, who will provide a question. Minglawami, tu yara yang wan dawar eh, jono nama Bo Sang mak mian. Lumiu Wang Zong Bani lo ing lei lu eh, yau yazi. Hello, ma'am. Very nice to meet you. My name is Busan, coming from Myanmar. Now I'm a PhD student in the Graduate School of Agriculture in Chutu University. I'm really proud to be here in such an excellent university that you joined as a visiting researcher in 1985, when I was born. <laughs> in Myanmar, I'm working at the Forest Department under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Conservation. My question is about uh, current peacemaking process. Uh, well, our country, Myanmar, is on the verge of democracy, and so there's a long way to go. On our road to democracy, one important issue is uh, national reconciliation, especially with the ethnic um, groups. Since uh, 60 years ago, Myanmar governments, I mean previous governments, have a struggle to create a unity of all the ethnic groups. But unfortunately, that goal has not been achieved yet. We know that you are now trying to solve this very difficult problem through a series of meetings such as the Union Peace Conference, 21st Century Panel. In this peacemaking process, you have to negotiate with the military leaders on the one hand, and ethnic group leaders on the other hand. I think this is very tough. So my question is, what is the biggest challenge for you to negotiate as a leader between the national army and ethnic armed groups? It's the same, really. It's uh, mutual understanding and confidence. The reason why people fight is because they don't believe in each other. It's because they, th they, they think that they have to preserve and defend themselves. They don't believe that the others, uh, uh, the, the other side or other sides 
in, in our case, we have many ethnic, ethnic armed groups involved in the peace process, that they do not believe that the others will, uh, will defend their rights. So it's a matter of mutual confidence, building up confidence, building up understanding, building up uh, the kind of approach where you think of the good of the country as a whole and not of your own organization, of your own group. Now, this is difficult to achieve because uh, we speak very blithely about unity out of diversity. But unity out of diversity is not something that can be implemented just because you want it to be implemented. If you want it to happen, you have to work towards it. And it's a long process, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of determination and motivation. We believe that this is possible. And because we believe that, is possi this, that this is possible, we, we work at it with, a, uh, with honesty. Now, honesty is very important in such negotiations. If you if you base your negotiations on deceit, then you will never succeed. You may, for a, for a short time, in, in the short run, you may be, be able to achieve some kind of understanding, but it will be broken if you have been dishonest about your moti motives and what you're prepared to offer. But I've often, uh, I've said to the different armed groups that when they come to the peace conference, what they should be thinking about is what they have to contribute towards a peace process, not about what they think they can get out of it. Now, of course, it's human nature always to want to try to get something out of a situation. But that is human nature, and I don't think we, we should uh, think that this is a great crime. But I think if you live in society, or if you live in a country which has to be built into a true union, then you have to give as well. You have to be prepared to give. It is something uh, basic, but something that we, had to, we have to repeat again and again, that give and take means you give as well as take. It doesn't mean that you take all and everybody else gives, which some people think it is. So that is what we find most difficult, making people understand that we have to work for the common good and building up confidence and trust in each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn to Shuzo Tani, please. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Noam Sansuchi. Uh, I'm from, uh, I'm Shuzo Tani from uh, the School of Government studying public policy. And from next April, I'll be working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a diplomat. <laughs> and... <laughs> I have to look at my diplomat. <laughs> Well, uh, my question today is not about diplomacy, fortunately, maybe. Uh, uh, in 2012, I had uh, the great pleasure of meeting a lot of Myanmar youths in the Ship for Southeast Asian Youth program. This is a program uh, sponsored by the Japanese government and has been fostering Japan and ASEAN uh, friendship for more than 40 years. And in this program, uh, which lasted for more than nearly two months, um, I got to meet a lot of Myanmar students and youths and thought that there were a lot of untapped potential yet in especially the younger generation of Myanmar. And as, as everyone knows, you have plenty of overseas experience. Uh, and uh, as a former researcher and also as a foreign minister, uh, I'd like to ask you what you think is the best uh, way for Myanmar students uh, to, uh, to promote Myanmar students to study abroad and also for countries like Japan to better welcome uh, students from overseas. Thank you. Thank you. The reason why we want to send our students to study abroad is because, as I mentioned earlier, our education, uh, education system has been very weak for the past half century. And in order to bring up the standard of our education system, we have to depend on the outside friends to help us as well. But the real need is to build up the education system within our country. We should go out to the world in order to broaden our vision and to learn more about the world and to learn more about the subjects which are a speciality in certain different places, not just to, uh, to make up for the weaknesses of our own education system. 
I have to say that the, we, we earlier mentioned the, the elitism that has been coming into Burma when the privileged are taught very well because they can send their children to the international school and other expensive private institutions, whereas the poor in the villages are, are um, taught very poorly. Now, it worries me that some of our children, the, the, the children of privileged families who go to these uh, expensive schools, think that it's a matter of pride not to speak their own language because they're taught in English. And this is something that I find really, truly, truly reprehensible. You should be proud of being able to speak your own language. I want our students and our young people to be proud of their own country, to be proud of their own culture. And then only will they be fit to go abroad and, the get, and get the best of what the world has to offer them. If they go out to the world thinking that their culture is not something to be proud of. If they go out into the world ashamed of the country and their people, they will not be able to bring back the best that the world has to offer. So that is what I want our students to do. I want them to go out as young people who are proud of their country, who are committed uh, to helping their country to make pro more progress, and who have gone out to learn what they can learn for the sake of the greater society back home rather than just for themselves. It's not any particular subject, whether they go out to learn about diplomacy, or medicine, or suburbalization, <laughs> which is a very difficult word to get one's tongue around. Uh, whatever it is they go abroad to study, we would like them to study with the intention of bringing it back home for those who have not had the privilege of the opportunity to broaden their horizons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we would now like to turn to our final question from uh, Zenta Nishio. Suchi-san, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Zenta Nishio. I am a PhD student here in um, Asia and African Area Studies. I have been researching about the slum community in Manila, the Philippines. After the World War II, uh, the people uh, migrated from rural province to urban areas, uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, the uh, Philippine government could not afford to provide legal housing to them. Uh, this is why in Manila now, a uh, tremendous slum community existing there. Then this housing issue uh, comes to represent social and economical inequality. Uh, Myanmar are now experiencing the um, uh, large economical growth, 7 to 8 percent GDP, and the Yangon is um, uh, really um, radical uh, urban expansion. Um, the Myanmar is a um, uh, transition to democracy, uh, but the, there is a country like the Philippines, uh, the, the, the rich people are more rich, and then there is a possibility to produce more poor people. Um, so, the, the Philippines also, it's, they produce a lot of poor people, even though the, the, under the democracy. So this is a really a uh, difficult question, but I would like to ask um, how the th ma making a balance between the democracy and the liberal economy is a really deep and uh, difficult uh, issue. How do you think uh, for the future of Myanmar and the future of the, the, the common people, how should we make it a balance, this uh, economy and uh, liberal, liberal, uh, the democracy for your, for your countries? Thank you. Well, thank you particularly because you mentioned the problem of affordable housing, which we're having to face in Rangoon in particular. Mm. Uh, we have to make sure that those who do not have houses should be given homes, but at the same time, we do not want to to, to uh, promote the problem of squatters. So this is a uh, uh, the, uh, um, an issue that needs a very, very finely balanced solution. But you're talking about the connection between democracy and development. You cannot have one without the other, not in the long run. Democracy will not be sustainable if the people cannot see that democracy means better development for them. Because in the end, it's quite natural that people should opt for a system
that offers them the best kind of life possible. I remember listening to a radio program on the BBC a long time ago. This is while I was still under house arrest, so that must have been about 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. I'm not quite sure of the exact date. There was going to be a general election in India. India, as you know, is the largest democracy in the world, and it also has a very high percentage of illiteracy. And in one of those programs, the interviewer had gone down to a village and was asking an ordinary village woman, apparently, who was, who was not able to read or write, who had never been to school, and was asking her for which party she was going to vote. And she told the interviewer, I'm going to vote for this particular party. And she was asked, and for which party did you vote in the previous election? And she said, I voted for another party in the previous election and the one before that. But now in this election, I'm going to vote for another one. And uh, the interviewer asked her why. And she said, well, in the last, before the last two elections, that party promised that they would give us running water. They still haven't given us running water. I'm not going to give them a third chance. Now, I like that answer of that woman because she was, maybe she was uneducated in the sense that she had never been to school, but she was very practical. First of all, she didn't like people who did not keep their promises. Neither do I. And so I sympathize with her entirely. And secondly, uh, she didn't think there was any point in voting for a member of parliament who had failed to deliver. And she said, what is the point in my voting for a party which still has not been able to give us running water after about, I think it was 10 years uh, since the first promise was made. So that is very normal and that is acceptable, that is right. You must make sure that a particular political system that is uh, that you are trying to root into the uh, society will also bring about better life, a better life for the people of the society. We, we are not working for democracy because it's some kind of ideal theory. It's because we think that is the system that would best enable our country to progress because it gives the greatest opportunity to the greatest number to be involved in the development process of our country. That is why, why we want democracy. Uh, I think it was Churchill who said that democracy is not such a good system, but the, the others are even worse. So we have to make do with the best that our human intellect has been able to devise so far. And we believe that it will work, but it will work only if we make sure that it, make, it uh, gives our people a chance to live better lives. And I hope that Japan will be helping in this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, uh, am I allowed to cast a question? I think it's only fair. Of course you can. <laughs> of course you can cast a question. Please. Because uh, yes. otherwise it's not a dialogue. <laughs> so I, what I would like to ask is this. What is it that interests you about a country like Burma? Is it our politics? Is it our history? Is it about our, is it our culture? Uh, what is it that interests you about my country? Now, whichever, whoever among you would like to answer. Any of you can answer this question. What interests you? OK, Nisha. The people. Oh. The common people there. <laughs> the, yeah. well, can you expand on that a little? Because uh, I never went to the Myanmar, especially Yango. I'm urban study. I want to know how, because uh, the media do not show so many, you know, people the detail, their library style or their daily experience. It's really difficult to touch through the media. So for me, the Myanmar is really attractive. Uh, if if I can go there, and then so that is a more daily transition because uh, Myanmar is uh, from the military to the democracy. The transition is really deep. So that is a really attractive for their um, daily transition. <laughs> you mean for research purposes? Uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> the different person should ask. <laughs> OK, would, would one, uh, one other person like to reply? Um, my interest in Myanmar is, of course, culture, because my research topic is food and culture. Um, so. I went to Myanmar and I tasted the food and also 
I in Japan, I my my family is a tea farmer. So also the Myanmar people also drink tea a lot, and also they make uh, pickles, like a tea pickle, pickle yeah. the lapeto, and I tasted it. The villagers welcomely uh, cooked those uh, with peanuts, yes. and they I really loved it. So yeah, my interest is always uh, lie onto the uh, food and people that how they serve it. And I, since I could uh, really see how they serve and how they uh, welcome us, so I'm now more interested in um, to experience more. If I can go back to Myanmar, that would be great. Thank you. You don't look as if you eat too much, but I'm glad you're interested <laughs> in food. <laughs> I was modest, but <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time today. Uh, unfortunately, we are a little bit pushed for time, so I would like to uh, bring this session to a close. So, first of all, I would like to ask everybody here to offer a very loud uh, applause, please. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid I don't always do what I'm supposed to do. I have to say that I object to people who have been told to applause. <laughs> I think they should only applause if they wish to, spontaneously. Would, would you like to spontaneously applause, please? <laughs> now, would it be possible just to ask you to remain here for a moment? What we would like to do now is take a, a commemorative uh, photo with you and the students, if you don't mind. And also, uh, we would like to offer you a bouquet of flowers. And I'm going to ask uh, Miss Soyako Harima to offer this to you as a representative from all of the students. Um, this bouquet of flowers is a, a token of our deep appreciation to you. And it's presented to you on behalf of the Kyoto University Yangon No Seikai. This is a Kyoto University Alumni Association in your country, and it also comes with a message for you. So could I ask uh, Ms. Soyako Harima to pass over the bouquet, please? Okay, and now, would it be possible to ask our president to also come back up to the stage, please, as well? And we would like to take one more photo with our president as well, please. Could I also ask maybe the students also to, to stand? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you today for making this a special event.